We'll continue on in this section and talk about how cross sections are updated and annotated in a little bit more detail. So we're carrying on in the same file that we've been in. I'm just going to move back to my multi views so I can see my 2D space and my 3D model view in here. So we move back into there. Now what we want to do in this situation is I want to force some sort of an update to my 3D model so it will see that change on the cross section. And the way we're going to do that in this situation is I'm going to go in and make a little bit of an adjustment to my corridor. And I'm going to widen the lane width from 12 feet out to 14 feet and see what how the cross sections behave with that and how our annotations behave with that. Now remember from the beginning that everything is referenced into this file. The corridor is not actually in here. So I'm going to go over and open up my corridor file so that I can edit that corridor. Now there's a lot of different ways we could edit a corridor, a lot of different changes you could make. Um, this is just live production work as people change the corridor. I want you to see how the cross sections will react and what will happen. What we're going to do to make things easy today is we're going to use our corridor objects tool and just select our corridor here and make a simple change using a parametric constraint that's already been set up. If you're not familiar with parametric constraints, what they really are is just a way to change a variable throughout the, the uh, extents of the project. So we got a variety of parametric constraints in here that are defining shoulder widths and curb widths and things like that. I've got one at the bottom here that defines my pavement width on the right hand side of the road. It's currently set to false, meaning it's not going to be used. It's going to use whatever's in the template, which is 12 feet in this imperial example. If I turn this on, what I'm going to do is I'm going to override that value in the template and make this distance 14 feet throughout the entire length of my project for the full station range. So I'll just change this value to a true. The corridor is going to reprocess. If you watch this cross section on the right here or the 3D model closely, as it updates here, that'll actually widen out. And I've now got a 14 foot shoulder there, or excuse me, a 14 foot lane width there on this side and still my 12 foot lane on that side. We'll just make that one simple edit. We could make other edits. We could change end conditions, change anything we want, but this is enough to at least see what's happening. We'll go back to our cross section file by just using the quick go to view previous group button. Changes us back over to the cross section file we were working in. And let's just go in and look at some cross sections. I'll pick station 52 this time just for something different. Let's zoom in on this one here. And if you notice that the cross section on the left hand side of the road, if I select that cross section element right there, you can see the width of the pavement goes six feet from the center line to here, and then an additional 12 feet to a total of 18 feet at the edge of the roadway. On the right hand side, we've got that same center lane of six feet, but this next lane, notice, now comes all the way out to 20 feet, not 18 where the annotation is shown at. So our cross section itself is updated automatically. Also notice that the outside point of our shoulder here is mislabeled, as well as the tie end point to the ground here is not correctly labeled. So anything that changes in the three-dimensional model automatically updates in your cross section. So any of those elements, whether it's our corridor, some manual that you've drawn in there, our pipes, our you know, drainage network, etc., they're going to update automatically because that's a live reference. What we don't do is we don't automatically update all the annotation for you. You don't want that happening every single time you make a change to your design model because you may be making hundreds or thousands of changes throughout the life of a project. So what we've done is we've left this for you to decide and say, yes, it's time to go ahead and update all the annotation now. And this is how I want that annotation to look. Because you may even want to choose a different annotation style. So how do we do that? Well, we go back to our original layout that we talked about here. 
if you remember, we discussed the, the different way that sheets were laid out coming from the 3D model into a drawing model that went to a sheet model. And that drawing model is where the annotation actually happens at. So I'm going to switch over to the drawing model for this cross-section, 52 plus 50. So I'll find that drawing model, and I'm going to switch over to that. Fit the view so I can see the cross-section, and here we've got that data. So this is where the data from the 3D file is actually referenced. So I, if I turn on my reference and I look at this here, and let's just resize that a little bit, and we'll turn off the display of that, you can see that data is coming from the reference. Everything else that's in here, the grid, all the labels, the annotations, if we were working in our frame annotation mode, or if we had had our set annotation set up differently to include frame annotations, that would be how it looked. All of that data actually exists in this file. So we could go in and we could individually grab things and move them around if we wanted. We could delete them if we wanted. We could place new data in here. And that's what we need to do to update our annotations. We've provided you a tool to make this as easy as possible to do. So going back to our Drawing Production tab, we've been working with name boundaries. Now I'm going to move over and talk about these annotation tools. We want to do model annotation here. We're not trying to annotate a single element. We want to annotate everything that's in here. So that's our entire model. We give you tools both to place annotations as well as remove them. So the first thing I want to do is remove the annotations. It prompts me whether I want to remove it from all models or just the model I'm in if I select no. Now remember, cross sections, we had 80 some cross sections out here. And if I want to update all of them, I can do that all at once just by saying yes, I want to annotate or remove annotation from all drawing models. If I left this set to no, it would only affect station 5250, my active model. So I'll click a data point to accept that. You can see it's fairly quick. It went through, it cleared out everything here, but it's also done every other cross-section out there. And just to show you that it indeed has, let's jump up to stay station 53. We'll fit that one to the view. And it indeed is also cleared out here. So all I'm seeing is the reference data and the border to that reference data. I can add the annotations back in now by going to the annotate model tool. Same prompt, do I want to do just my cross-section or all of them? I want to do all of my models. And then it prompts me with what kind of annotation do I want to put on here. Annotations are defined in something called an annotation group. And that's what holds together all these things that you want to happen at once. Let me go ahead and click Accept on this and let it start processing, because it does take a few seconds to process. In this situation, or example, our annotation group called XS Grid with Annotations defines the grid that we want to put on the cross sections, how that looks, how it's spaced, how it's labeled, as well as the individual feature annotations that we had with offsets and elevations being labeled. If you watched the previous videos, you saw the frame annotation from cross sections. That's simply a different annotation group, choosing to annotate things in a different manner. All right, our annotations have now appeared. Um, the video was not real time. I did clip out about 45 to 60 seconds of, of processing time while it was going through annotating all of those cross sections. Uh, remember, it was about 80 some cross sections that we did there. So there's a lot of work to go in and find all of those points in every single cross section. Remember, that's all live data that it had to find. But it's now gone in and updated these. You can see the edge of pavements are labeled at 20 foot. The edge of my shoulder is now at 24. It's corrected the um, tie down points in here well and labeled those at the proper place. I will jump back over to the section we started at at 5250 just to show you that it did come back and annotate these. So we did do every section in our plan set here. And because the sheets are live references of these, the sheets are automatically updated with all that data too because this is just a reference of the drawing. So everything is here. Now in addition to this kind of automated single annotation like we've done here, you can actually layer multiple pieces of annotation on top of this if you want. Um, so I've got another annotation group that I'm going to go through and process and run here also. 
I'll select that other annotation group from my pick menu here. We've got another one set up that will label uh, right away locations and guardrail locations within our plan. Now, I've had the question asked, why did we create two? Why not combine them all into one? We just chose to do that as an example, showing you that you can work with multiple annotation groups. But if you always wanted to annotate all of this in a single pass, that could certainly have been a single annotation group and set up that way. No problem doing that. So we'll let these annotations run and talk about what gets added onto the sheets. All right, our process is finished. And once again, it was not quite real time. I included or I clipped out uh, about a minute of processing time there as it went through and found it. But what this annotation group did is it searched through the plan view portions of the file to try to locate it uh, right away. So in the plan view, we've got some two-dimensional geometry elements. And based on their feature, representing either existing or could be proposed right away, it located those features and then annotated them in each of our cross sections. We've annotated them with a little orange line and an E-R-O-W for the existing. Uh, didn't have any proposed in this project, but it would have put in proposed right away as well had we had that. And because everything is a live reference, you'll see those carry over onto your sheets as well here. Now let's look at another station up in this range. And we'll see that it's also, in addition to locating those right-of-way lines, this particular annotation group we've told to also go look for guardrail. And if you find geometry that represents guardrail based on its feature definition, then drop a little cell into here that looks like a piece of guardrail. So this is a little bit different than our pipe. We have not actually modeled the guardrail in our 3D file to clip through it. That's another option if you spent the time to actually model your guardrail. We did not. What we did in this case is just had a line in the two-dimensional space. It was actually a line generated by our template that said there's guardrail at this location based on a feature definition. Our annotation group found that and dropped a cell in here to represent that piece of guardrail. Now the last thing I want to talk about with cross-section annotation is I want to introduce you to a tool called Place Label. So still on our Drawing Production tab, I'm going to go to this tool called Place Label. And this allows you to add individual labels to your cross-sections. Let's say, for example, we wanted to label this back a ditch point. I could go in here and label this. So I can choose what, how I want to label that, and that's going to be based on a text favorite that's going to pick up those civil parameters, such as offsets and elevations, and be able to calculate those values. Now, you can combine those text favorites and place them with a cell so they're properly spaced the way you want them and looking the way you want. We've just provided some examples in the workspace here for some plan view labels, some profile view labels, as well as some cross-section labels. So we'll place a cross-section label here for offset and elevation. I can choose to place that with or without a leader. There's a variety of options here on how I rotate it and such. And I can data point where I want to place that and place that label. Now these labels look different than the ones we placed before. Uh, you could have set them up to look exactly the same if that was what you were interested in doing. We're just showing you different options here where this label is placed horizontally, it was placed in a different color, uh, all controllable by how you want your environment to work. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you and see you next time.